Thank you all. It's so lovely to be with you all this morning. Have you had a good weekend? Yes. Thank you. Well, I want to welcome you to my home, meaning I have an office just about one floor below here, and this is where I spend a lot of my time. So thank you for joining us today. I just have a brief thought before I invite our other guests who are going to join me on stage. The first thing I want to do is just give a reference from a poem. I found that starting uh, moments like this with poetry is a great way to pause and reflect and realize what's happening to us. And so I'm going to read uh, a piece. Who here has heard of George Moses Horton? Normally when I ask, no one raised their hand. I was hoping that today we might get some more hands. I have to thank my husband for pointing out the, the work of George Moses Horton. He was a slave born approximately 1797 and who earned money by publishing poems. He published about 150 poems in three volumes and was able to make some of the money and keep it. Uh, but he wrote a series of poems that are beautiful, uh, some in local dialect of the community and some in uh, the, the, the majority English, you might say. I'm reading a piece uh, from his poem entitled George Moses Horton, Myself. My genius from a boy has fluttered like a bird within my heart, but could not thus confined her powers employ, impatient to depart. She, like a restless bird, would spread her wings, her power to be unfurled, and let her songs be loudly heard, and dart from world to world. So welcome. I would now like to invite to join me on stage our host, uh, Joey Ito, who's the director here at the Media Lab. Please join me, Joey. Thank you. So Joey is an, an activist, an entrepreneur, has a long series of credits, but I rather would give you the personal introduction to say that because Joey is here and is working on a long process to change the culture of the Media Lab, I am here. So thank you, Joey. Thank you. That's not, that's not the only reason you're here, but not the only one, it but makes me happy that you're here. If we look at the history of the Media Lab, we're in a period where we have an opportunity to ask hard questions about what culture means, and that it's a fresh season where the Media Lab is more relevant today uh, because of the work you're doing. And I'm happy to be here today in, in the season that we're in with Media Lab. So thank Absolutely, you. Absolutely, thank you. A part of his role then is to help make sure that the faculty and students and research staff have the tools we need to do research that helps invent the future. So I wanted to ask if we can start. For those who haven't followed lately what's going on in the Media Lab, can you help us by please introducing an overview of the lab, uh, talking particularly about our model for how we invent the future, and also who's around these days, because they may know the Media Lab as a place of robotics and computers, but we really have a much broader purview today. Yeah, so the, the Media Lab's about 32 years old, and it's a peculiar, it was an experiment by uh, then president uh, of, the media, of MIT, Jeremy Wiesner, and um, Nicholas Negroponte, who was in the Architecture Machine Group. And it was an experiment on multiple fronts. So it was a lab that was also an academic program, which is like combining church and state, which is usually not allowed. Um, and it was, a, it was a corporate consortium model, um, one of the first of its kind. And this allowed us to pool all of the funding that we got and to distribute it uh, to the students and faculty so that all the intellectual property was shared so that everybody could work together. And it was also uh, set up so that the companies didn't tell us what to do. Um, and therefore, it wasn't like a grant. And it allowed us to have this much more, uh, uh, um, how would I say, it, it, uh, um, permissionless innovation system. Um, and you know, Nicholas was a good salesman, and we had a, a lot of great uh, founding faculty. So we had a kind of suspension of disbelief from the beginning, where we would argue and uh, that we were doing things that they wouldn't know to ask us for, and we were literally trying to invent the future. And we created everything from e-ink to the er earliest. Um, uh, uh, demo of uh, car navigation to um, all kinds of things, and it was. And, and it, since it came from the architecture machine group, it was uh, a lot of the early work was between machines and um, and, and humans. Later, a little bit more on um, the early social uh, 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 in internet and the social networks. Then we started the sort of age of big data, 
And more recently, the Media Lab has shifted into hard sciences, satellites, um, but also um, uh, uh, biological sciences and, and chemistry and electrical engineering. Um, the, the, the institute, as you can imagine, is like, wait, 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 what, you know, how do you define what you do? And I often say that um, we're defined by a process, so we're very much about um, building things. So we don't do pure scholarship, we do theory and practice. So the old saying used to be demo or die. Um, I, I, when I got here, I said, no, we, we, we don't have to just demo to big companies and get them to make it, we can deploy. So I made it deploy or die. And then um, um, when I was visiting President Obama once, at, and um, I was sharing the story, and, and he was a, I could see him thinking, and he said, demo or die, or deploy or die. And he says, I think you need to work on that messaging, Joey. And, 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 and so, 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 so I turned it to just deploy. And then some of, some of the younger students um, said, Joe, when we complained about it, you didn't do anything, but the President of the United States says it, and then you change it? You know, what are we? You know? And uh, so that was funny. But, but we're, we're now an institution, we, we have about 800 people, if we include the Europe's, 250 of them are, are grad students, and we've got um, sep uh, one of the largest Europe populations. Um, we've, we're probably about an $80 million a year run rate, and we uh, um, uh, have about 93 uh, member sponsors. Um, and, uh, but we can't grow because we don't have any more space. So we're now, this is, we're, we're at the maximum of our size. And, and Danielle is one of the victims of this uh, issue. But, but, but we're, um, but sorry, the last thing I'll say is that the, this, the, the funding and the opportunity that we have provides us the ability to fund those projects that would not otherwise be funded. So, and then also this weird academic program that we have, um, it, um, Media Arts and Sciences, which is code for Department of None of the Above, um, allows us to do things like satellites and justice, um, allows us to create these intersectional spaces. And, and for us, it's almost a responsibility to do that which other people would not do. So when we hire faculty, I say, if you, if, could you get a job anywhere else to do what you want? And if the answer is yes, we don't need you. If, could you get funded to do what you want by anybody else? If the answer is yes, we don't want you. We want the people who want to do something extraordinary, who can't fit academically anywhere else, and who can't be funded by anybody else. And that's where we're trying to place our bets. And, when, and then eventually, by the time they get tenure and get fancy, that should become a thing, and somebody else should be doing it, and then they need to reinvent themselves again. So let's take a pause and note one of the themes of your recent book, Whiplash. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the emphasis you put on the idea that you gave this history of the technical aspects of the Media Lab. Early on, a lot of it was product-based. We admitted cool things that you could do between a human and a computer, and it became also an issue of kind of um, things in the, the networks and things were data-driven. And you talk a lot about the importance to look at things as complex systems these days. Can you please discuss your view of what complexity in society and in the problem spaces that we address now? Yeah. Um, so the early days of the, inter of, of, of the Media Lab really were kind of people like Alan Kay making comments like you uh, 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 predict the future by inventing it. And, and we invented a lot of stuff. And, but, but most of the stuff, I mean, some of the people like Seymour Papert did think about educational systems and things like that. But, but most of the world was focused on trying to make the world more convenient and uh, um, um, efficient and effective, and and really weren't systems thinkers. And we had systems thinkers in in people like uh, Danella Meadows and Jay Forrester, but they were doing sort of big models. Um, but most of the engineers weren't really thinking in systems; they were thinking in sort of particular um, um, products. I, I think today, so so even the Media Lab thought that social science and 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 politics and history and all this stuff was way too fuzzy and un not applied. And that, um, um, but now we know that most of the confounding problems of today, uh, climate, uh, 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 social uh, inequity, and health are extremely complex systems where you don't really know whether a particular thing that you're doing is gonna help or hurt. And, um, and I think the idea of taking the, the complex systems, this is something that Danielle has a, a lot of background in, so I'm, I'm really excited to have her as a part of our team. But, but our, our, our faculty are not uh, from that systems thinking community. And if we want to deploy the things we're making, in a, a responsible way, we, we need to think in systems. And so, so I think as we hire new people, and, and this, the good thing is every two years, students graduate, and so the students are bringing with them a, 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 a much more complex 
um, sensibility. But, but I think part of complexity is, uh, and complex systems is bringing the social sciences in. And so having these intersectional faculty and projects where the social scientists are connecting with the engineers is, is tremendously important, in addition to more of the rigorous systems work. And, and to me, that's my, my, my passion is, is, is complex systems. And as you say, this was an important part of my training doing my PhD here at MIT in what's then called the engineering systems, which brought together management, social science, and also um, uh, engineering. And you can just give a brief example of this as you look at issues around um, justice and mass incarceration. Yep. You're applying this directly in some research as well. Yeah, so, so my, my, my work right now, personally, um, one of the things, I, I came here to mainly just um, um, work on the operations of the lab, but they also allowed me to start uh, 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 studying and learning and teaching and, and doing research. And the area that I'm most interested in is um, uh, algorithmic, fairness, which I don't think could actually be achieved. Um, I think the engineers are trying to achieve it just the way that the uh, insurance industry achieved what they called actuarial fairness, um, which was not the same as social fairness. And, and uh, we, just literally a few days ago, we were, we were having this discussion where, um, and, and this is interesting that it's 50 years, because it was 1968 um, that uh, that discussion starts where the civil rights movement and the, um, uh, the feminists were arguing for the principle of solidarity, where, fair, where, where insurance was supposed to be, the idea was that the government should run it and it should try to allow everyone as a community to support each other's in need. And the neoliberal emergence around that time said, no, 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 actuarial fairness is a calculation that you can do so that we can calculate the risk of every individual and the pricing of that insurance will be fair. And so what they do is they took the word fair, and the last, and, and the, um, um, uh, Kaylee Horan just did her PhD at MIT, she's an assistant professor in uh, history, on this notion of how they, they were the mathematicians, probably a lot from MIT, were able to separate social fairness from actuarial fairness and turn actuarial fairness into the dominant one um, that, 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 that is exactly, not exactly, but it's, it's very metaphorically similar to how computer scientists are trying to take fairness and make it a checkbox and move on. And, and what we're seeing, and, and this and Ibram Kendi, who, uh, who um, Danielle introduced me to, I think there's a really interesting um, conversation right now about uh, the idea that algorithms may, first of all, I don't think algorithms can actually be fair. They can be accurate, but they can accurately reproduce um, and make even more invisible the inequities of society. And what we want to do is to sort of figure out how to pull them in. So one of the projects I'm working on personally is we have, I have a few researchers in Kentucky where they're now deploying algorithmic uh, risk assessments and other things to more accurately predict recidivism rates, which a lot of even MIT engineers confound with, with crime. And what we're doing is we're, we're doing a few things. We're trying to do a long-term study on the effects of things like an, um, conditions of release, like ankle bracelets and, 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 and um, drug testing, but also turning the uh, lens around and stop just looking at the data of the poor people, but collecting data on the judges, collecting data on the ADs, and looking for the long-term effects of policy. And, 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 and really trying to, because I, I think I come from a privacy background, and so I think in democracy what you want is transparency of those in power and privacy of those who are poor. But what we're ending up with is transparency of poor people and opacity of rich people. And so, so, so that, that's, that's a big deal. We're doing this also. So in Kentucky, we actually have the cooperation of the Kentucky government. So we're doing that inside. And in Massachusetts, we're working with the ACLU and going from the outside. So we have a project called um, Court Watch, where we're sending people into courts. This is with, with, with the nonprofit. And they're taking a record of all the things. Because we don't have any data on what happens in, in courts. We don't know when judges break laws. So we're collecting all that data. Um, and we're also collecting the outcomes of decisions by ADs and, and, and um, prosecutors and trying to show the impacts on society of those decisions and using machines and data for that. So, so that's, that's what we're trying to do, is that algorithms are just trying to increase prediction, which just transfers agency from poor people to rich people, and turning it around to model causal networks to understand the long-term effects of the policies that are deployed on poor people. That's, that's something I'm personally excited about. I think they're excited, right. too. A good crowd, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I think it's nice to give that concrete example. In our next discussion, I'll be bringing some people on stage to discuss the topic of Afrofuturism, yep. which includes 
what it means for us to create technology, but also to create stories that help us imagine a positive future, in this case from the black community point of view. Yep. But can you comment briefly on what do you see as the role of the Media Lab as a technology-driven organization mm -hmm. to influence the culture of MIT and the world? Yeah, so, so I think, you know, well, first of all, whether we're effective or not, I think that's for others to judge and for history to judge. And my, um, uh, and so I, I don't like people who, who um, announce that they're doing it and then, um, uh, but, but having said that, I have a strong intent to try to have as much impact on um, this as possible. And I think, I think the Media Lab has a tremendous amount of responsibility. Um, I, I do too. I remember when I was er in the early days helping to set up a lot of the layers of the internet and I thought just connecting people would, you know, bring peace, you know, and now it's turned into, I don't, I don't know everyone's age here, but like, like the, I, it's like the little girl in The Exorcist that, you know, turns, that's what it feels like to me, the internet. I, I created this thing and now it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, that, that, so, so I feel, and the Media Lab should feel like that too. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we created, social media, all this stuff in the last 30 years, it's, it's, it's here. We got to do something about it. So, so I feel like we have a extra responsibility um, to uh, take the technology and, and, and make, and be socially aware ourselves but also do something about it. Um, and so we have a number of groups doing that. I mean, you're, you're, it's interesting, we had a faculty meeting and we actually, originally we had the, the three things of the Media Lab were um, uniqueness, impact, and magic. And then, and then somebody said, but impact could be like a car wreck. And, and we noticed that only a few faculty had justice uh, in their mission statements. And I think, I think justice is, is, is key, so we, sh we need to focus on that. That's a wonderful place to stop. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here today, Joey. Thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Thank you for joining us.